Oh, right, all right, all right. Welcome back, everybody. It's been a fun week sitting on the sidelines of the greatest of all time discussion, watching everybody shout at each other, call each other names, and basically clutch at straws to justify where their favorite player, or why their favorite player, I should say, is the best in the world. In this video, we're going to go through it all. We're going to explain some of the drama, some of the details of these players' careers, and, uh, of course, at the heart of it, we're going to explain why people are literally just making crap up. And there's just so many justifications and mental gymnastics to come to some of the conclusions people have gotten to. We're going to go through it and break it down. So first of all, the list finally finished the other day. We got Serilet number two about a week, uh, about five days ago. And then we got Maru coming out just after that at number one. Now this came out just after Serilet defeated Maru 4-0 at Katowice. So it's especially controversial to say that Maru is number one and Serilet's number two coming out at this time. But this is not decided on by the great StarCraft authority. Uh, this is not something people voted on. This is simply an opinion piece that took a lot of time to write by Meisenau. Now, Meisenau is a great writer on, on StarCraft 2 Team Liquid website, goes on there, and, and these articles are actually a great read. You guys should read through them. Each one is like an essay. It takes a long time to read, but there's so many good memories. And if you haven't followed StarCraft 2 for all its history, you might actually pick up and learn a lot of things. For me, I spent like four hours on stream going through some of the articles, looking up old videos and matches, and just having a great nostalgia trip. So overall, massive thanks to Miz for putting the effort into writing the articles even though I think he's completely wrong in the way he's actually ranked the players. So before we get into the criticism, let's talk about how he did actually rate things. So he actually set up a rating criteria at the start where he said, look, there's different periods. The most competitive was 2013 to 2015 when Kesper was in for Heart of the Swarm. Uh, he also was a few weird, many, many weird things with how he rated things. The first one being he's like, basically, I think second place is worth about two points and winning a tournament worth three. Whereas in the GSL point split, when you get points, normally it's you get two points for winning and just under one for getting second place. So he's basically saying, hey, if you get to the finals, that's worth a lot more than tournaments normally actually place it in terms of points in a circuit. This is crazy because for me, I'm like, dude, who remembers second place? I used to be a competitor when I got second. No one remembered. I'd be angry. I'd count it as a failure. And the thing is, none of the fans, as well as a lot of the commentators, even remember who comes second in a lot of these tournaments. The only time you remember is where you remember who won and you go, oh yeah, he beat so-and-so. They're the person who got beat in the finals. Don't get me wrong, they still did a lot to get there and they do deserve a lot of points. But I think if you think about this in terms of the legacy of a player, the achievements, how much they are remembered in the fans, the audience's minds, as well as in their own mind, what they achieved, I think winning is worth a lot more than 1.5 times as much as second place. I think it should be worth probably more than double two to one is fair but maybe even uh two and a half to one three to one potentially i know that might be a bit extreme but i really feel that when it comes to sporting events and competition that first place is so important now miz goes on to basically say look the the, the gold standard here is korean star leagues gsl star league pro league uh and during players prime year so when they were playing their best not if they had a bit of a tail end where they lost a lot of matches he's kind of excluded that which is fair enough i think that's totally okay so i think i should actually give a bit of context about 2013 to 2015 because i actually agree with this by the way being the peak period i competed in this period started commentating in the middle latter end of 2015 because i could not win money during that period not much anyway a little bit it was very very hard there was so many pro gamers and the reason is the only re like lol was picking up in 2013 onwards uh, there was no other real big esports in that period, right? Uh, I think it was like late 2015, early 2016 is when CS really started to pop off. Uh, Dota, I guess, started to pop off maybe around 2014, 2015. But StarCraft 2 was very much the biggest esport leading into this period. And it still had a massive amount of focus of much of the esports talent. A lot of audience was still watching a massive audience. Uh, but also the pro gamers in Korea were focused on it. And when Kesper got in, this was the team's that were sponsored by Samsung. They were sponsored by Jinair, Green Wings, KT. All their biggest corporations had teams. It was on TV. All people cared about was winning kind of pro league matches. They had team houses with coaches and chefs and all sorts of stuff. And it was, it just, there was a huge focus on StarCraft, especially in the Korean scene at that time. So even though if you took a player from these days and, and competed against that, obviously Serral, if he was planted in that game, as long as he got used to the timings of Heart of the Swarm, I think he'd smash. I think in modern day, Maru would go back and smash those guys back then as well. But that's because we know more about the game. Players have had more time to figure all the things out. In terms of the raw competitiveness, how many people there were trying to be the best, getting coached, sharing builds, developing the plays, it was an incredibly competitive period in StarCraft. So I think this is actually very fair to rate this period higher. 
how much I, uh, hard to say, hard to say, but we'll get back to that. Okay, so we've got the gold standard, these, these Korean individual leagues um, saying, okay, that's really important. And basically saying, look, GSL from like 2023 onwards isn't worth as much because obviously not as much prize money or anything. SSL 2017 also wasn't as important. So the tournament, you know, fell off or whatever. It does get lo uh, worth less, super fair. Um, Miz has also said, hey, look, world championships, I weighted world championship tier tournaments to be equivalent or slightly more valuable than Korean individual leagues, depending on the specific tournament. Now, at first I was like, come on, don't put WESG in the same tier as these. Like, there's, you know, Gamers 8 even last year popped up. I know lots of prize money. People, players cared about it. Same with WESG. But you just had one round of qualifiers leading into a new tournament with no history, uh, no big live audience there. And it's not a tournament that has the same sort of memory behind it in the fan base as an IEM or a BlizzCon. So an IEM World Championship that is, a, or a BlizzCon. These are the tournaments that had huge crowds. There were circuits leading into it where you get points over the year. There's a lot more story building. There's a lot more um, memory and therefore importance in the players' minds when you're playing in front of that big crowd of people who really care about what's happening. So I do think those are a bit more important in that regard. But in terms of like competitiveness, I think what Miz is saying is actually completely fair. So like a lot of the early world championships had these 16 player single limb uh, formats, BlizzCon 2016 to 2017 as well. Uh, you know, it's like an eight player quota, you know, where half of the players are coming from the foreign region. It wasn't very strong at that time. They all lose in the first round. So fair enough. He's saying, look, these ones not as competitive, but once Serral and Rainer came out, 2018 world championships onwards are actually worth more. So there's actually a lot of fair criteria in here, along with the ones that I actually disagree with. Also, WSG was definitely weaker. Um, and, and by quite a lot, not only being a new tournament, it also had a weaker, you know, player pool. But Miz said, I counted it to be worth just slightly less than a season of Korean individual leagues because of the amount of prize money that would have made it a high priority for players at the time. I, I don't think that makes up for the fact that it is a less competitive tournament necessarily. It does a bit. I think just it should be... Maybe not just slightly less. I think it should be a bit more less than that. I really don't think WSG is a big tournament people remember the matches from for the most part. Um, and, uh, you know, I don't think it left that big a mark on the legacy of StarCraft, as well as, of course, having, you know, a format that was less competitive. Um, they've also said that basically the uh, 2020 to 2023 season finals for ESL Masters and DreamHack are actually similar to CODES. That's because there's no more region lock. Koreans, foreigners, all the best players in the world are all playing together in these. And he's, they've also said, look, we're not penalizing the pandemic online era. They were still competitive, still high prize tournaments. Just because it's online, we're still going to count it, which I think is fair enough. It also helps Maru a lot because Maru does not play well overseas and he plays much better when he's actually playing <laughs> online from home. He had a great end to 2021. But we'll, we'll get to that later. And then there's a bunch of stuff about other tournaments being rated differently, but let's move on from here. Let's actually go to number one. Let's talk about Maru's achievements. What makes a player the greatest of all time? Okay, so we've got Maru here. Big picture, I'm holding a trophy. Seven GSL Codest titles, eight other Wikipedia Premier titles, three of the most dominant pro league seasons, 10 uninterrupted years as top tier pro player. It is, I mean, undoubtedly, like Maru has an amazing career in history. Like this is not something I'm arguing against in this video, by the way. Like Maru is one of the greatest players of all time, hands down. I do want to put that in addendum. Two of those GSLs are 2023. So they are worth a little bit less. Uh, but there's a lot of great results in here. Lots of good first and second places. And and I think the one which a lot of people who are maybe more modern fans or foreign fans who never watched as much Pro League if it wasn't on their time zone might not realize is Miz puts a massive weight on Pro League. And this is something I really needed to read the articles to truly appreciate. I already told you guys that Pro League was very important at the time. It was on, on TV. The teams that were giving these guys big salaries at the times, they did not care if you did well in individual leagues. If you fall out of GSL, they're like, eh, you win. You win your ace match in pro league on TV, you're getting bonuses. You're getting you're getting happy prizes. He's got an MVP prize for a pro league season here as Maru. And Maru was a very good player in pro league. We can see here, you know, he kind of came in. He was like, okay. Um, then in 2015, in 2014, he was like, okay, 2015, 27 wins, 16 losses, which is obviously pretty damn, that's really good for pro league. Um, especially depending on who you faced in those matches, who you matched up against. But in 2016, he got 22 to four, one of the, the best pro league records and actually led Jin Air to their first pro league title in history. Apparently 
uh, in anything when you throw in six odd years. Oh, so apparently they never won in League of Legends either. That's cool. So essentially, Maru had an amazing kind of season in Pro League, and that's when everyone's preparing so much time into best of ones and builds. So this does weigh in a lot in terms of like he, I think you could argue maybe Maru's one of the greatest team league, like best of one sniper preparation based players of all time here. I think this like backs that up. It's hard to say though, because you could only compete in that format if you're competing at that time. Nonetheless, it, this is actually a big boost that I think a lot of people are overlooking. They don't really think about what Pro League meant, and it was a very big thing at the time. Now, not only that, but Maru also, check this out, we go back. He actually won a tournament, WCS Korea, in 2013, which is like pretty huge. That was an early peak for him. He got a lot of like top fours and stuff in this period as well. So you can see he was like a very solid player from 2013, and I kind of wish that Miz counted top fours as much as he did top twos, or like at least should, hey, these are worth quite a lot. Because I think these don't really get mentioned, but these are all actually really good, these top fours. And then in 2015, wins a Star League as well, a second championship win, and bum, 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 goes to IEM Taipei, gets a second place there as well. So we've got this like early career where he's like good in pro league, and he wins two tournaments, gets second in another one which is pretty damn impressive. Lots of top fours, lots of top eights mostly. A very kind of solid run in his career. And then he starts doing really well in Pro League 2015, 2016. Unfortunately, he doesn't really do well in individual tournaments for quite a while here. He does get a second at a WESG tournament, not the most important tournament at all at that time. It got bigger in a year or two later than that when it got more prize money. A lot of top eights. And it wasn't until 2018, of course, when he started to really blow up his career and become the dominant player in Korea. Now, before we get to talking too much about 2018, though, I want to go back to this, this one here and say, cool, okay, so there's a big gap there where, yeah, he had a good pro league run in 2016, kind of dry 2017, 2016 for individual performance results, no championships or anything there. But 2013 to 2015, how valuable is this? I think these 1v1 win wins are, like, actually really quite worthwhile. They're really good. But I would ask the question, was he ever the best player in the world at those times? And this is something which I think is really important. Does anyone, I was watching and playing a lot of StarCraft this time, I don't think I ever thought of Maru as, as one of the best. I personally, and you guys can let me know if you disagree, I thought of him as one of the best Terrans, probably top two. He won some tournaments, there were so many tournaments going on at this time. Probably maybe a little higher than where I think of Bion right now, where Bion is like a really good Terran. Unfortunately, the top guys are so dominant, Bion doesn't really win big international tournaments. So like, that's why I'm saying a bit higher than him. It's like, you know, but 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 definitely lo lower than where he is now, where like guys like Innovation, if you think best Terran 2015, I'm thinking probably Innovation. Oh, Maru's a good pro league sniper and pro league is important for the Korean teams. Does that in a 1v1 sport though, in a 1v1 competition really make you, like, like you, I feel like you, you need to be winning more tournaments during this time to actually be considered the best in the world. Case in point, IEM Taipei guys, do you remember this tournament? Do you remember this tournament? IEM Taipei, let's open that page up. It's not even gonna load. Check this out. What's going on? He lost 4-3-2. Oh God, oh God, Voldemort. Now, we don't say this name anymore. For those who don't remember, Life was an absolute mad dog. Um, they played in the grand finals of IEM Taipei. This was a super epic match. And Life ended up winning 4-3. to three. Very close grand finals. Now, the reason why this is interesting, though, in general, is because Life actually was considered the best player in the world at that time. And he was a player who had an insane career. And actually, funny story about this match. And this is no shade on, on Mario. He's a beast. Um, Life was actually drunk in this grand finals. Life literally had been out clubbing all night. You can see him here looking, you don't, a lot of fans are like, oh, he just looks kind of a little tired. He he had not slept. Uh, as far as I know, he'd stumbled in drunk. Uh, I know from the admin after playing his previous semi-final, the booth stunk so much because he hadn't even showered after his night out that he, the next players, they brought them into the booth to play and the player refused to play and because it smelt so bad, they had to open the booth up, put fans in there and air it out for like half an hour before the next semi-final could play. And then they went through to this match. So I don't know if that was Maru or Maru's opponent who played in his booth in the previous round. Maybe Maru got handicapped from having to inhale some of his stench. But this was like this sort of like John Jones, like I party and still just win the next day sort of thing. That's what you got from life. And that's what I mean when, when I think about best player in the world. I think about a player who is dominant in the 1v1 sport. So let's go look at life's results. And I want to show you the difference in this most competitive period. Life 
I'm sorry for talking about life. I know some people are going to be mad I'm even mentioning his name. He came in, first time qualifying for GSL. He just got second in a TSL, which people are like, whoa, who is this kid? Wins GSL over MVP, the King of Wings. First GSL codes he got into. I was watching it live. It was, uh, the, the energy was insane. MLG Fall wins. Iron Squid wins. GSL regular season wins again. MLG Winter winning. And we're, we're, we're well into 2013 now as well. Um, you know, he's winning IEM New York. Wins DreamHack Bucharest. Gets second in DreamHack Winter. There's a bunch of other good placings in here. He gets first at the World Championship 2014. Wins another GSL. Wins that IEM Taipei. Wins SSL season. Sorry, that's that's an SSL code. Never mind. He doesn't win that SSL. Uh, yeah. Gets second in another World Championship. Barely losing to SOS 4-3 to three in this one here. I mean, this is a streak of dominance in the most competitive period. No one matches this. If you look at anyone else's run in this three and a half year period from late 2012 to like early 2016, nobody matches these performances, this many golds. Because that period, it was so hard. There was so much competition. No one, like you guys look at Sarah Lynn Maru's dominance now. If you didn't watch back then, this amount of wins, this amount of results was actually like nobody had ever done this before. Now, for those who don't know, Life then got caught for match fixing. He'd thrown a few maps that people had bet on, and then he'd won the series anyway uh, in like Pro League, I believe, and a few other matches. Got caught for that. Uh, he got sentenced, like literally criminally charged with match fixing, and is obviously an outcast, and it's why people don't talk about him. Meisenhauer and a lot of the, the very big Korean fans over on Team Liquid probably don't want to mention him because in Korean culture for them, even mentioning his name, they don't like you even bringing him up. They're just like, he's an embarrassment on the scene. He did a lot of damage to the StarCraft scene. It was after that when a lot of the Pro League sponsors pulled out because they didn't want to be associated with the match fixing. And this was a bit of a disaster for the Korean scene. But if we ignore that, I think this is what an absolutely ridiculous dominant record looks like. And Miz said, he actually said, if a player has only a short career, I'm going to rank it. Like, I'm not going to punish them for not being over across such a big period if, if the peak is still high. I think if we're being honest, life deserves a spot in this top 10. And you know, if we really believe 2013 to 2015 is that much more competitive, it's up to you. I don't I don't necessarily, I do think this is an incredibly impressive run. Um, you know, I do think this is a pretty amazing run, guys. But I personally, I, I feel like if you're like, nah, that is worth so much more, you've really got to remember, is it is life the greatest of all time? He might be. It might have been a short hot streak, but you could argue he was the greatest player of all time. That's an argument you can actually make. Fun little result, by the way. Little tidbit here. During that period, life got to play him in this tournament. One of my good memories. We played at about 1.30 a.m. after being at the venue for like 13 hours. Fun series. I took a ZVZ off him. Roach War on Star Station. Fun game. He absolutely destroyed me in the Ling Bane skirmishes in the other two games. Try, trying to Ling Bane Microverse life was basically signing your own death warrant. It was fun though. It was really fun. All right, guys, we got a little bit of off track there. Let's go back to Maru's career. Let's fast forward to 2018. This is where Maru established himself as not just a player who is very top tier, amazing pro league player, which I think in Miz's mind makes him like best pro league player is like so much better than winning individual tournaments, which for me, I think it's important, and I think it's more important than I thought it was after reading his article. I still don't think it beats winning championships and especially world championships. But 2018 is when Maru went from being top two Terran, maybe top three Terran, to being clearly the best Terran in the world. He won every GSL in 2018. Four seasons, four, three, three seasons of GSL, uh, WESG at the start of the year, goes on to win GSL the next year, uh, goes on in 2020 to win a, a super tournament, uh, gets second in another GSL, and, uh, you know, goes on in 2021 to win a series of online tournaments, the DreamHack Masters ones. Uh, so finally beating some international competition and showing up, which he had, had issues with before. Wins GSL season three in 2022. Goes on as well to win a couple of GSLs uh, this last year, but they are a bit lower rated since the prize money dropped drastically for GSL in 2023. Okay, so a lot of people talk about these results because uh, especially not only was he rising, Serral started to dominate the international scene. There was a region lock. There were kind of separate systems, two systems uh, they, they kind of had going. And WESG was a, a tournament they actually faced at the start of this year. So a lot of people point to this as saying, even though it says 2017 at the top, it was because the, the, the qualifiers and stuff leading into it were in 2017, but the tournament itself was actually March 2018. And you can see that in the semifinals, Maru actually 3-0'd Serral. 
And Maru, Cyril had just won his first tournament. And after this, Cyril would go on an unbeaten streak uh, for a very long period, uh, up until much later, you know, in the year. Like he, so so the fact that Maru 3 0 him, and then they both went into their separate systems, and Maru was like dominating Korea, Cyril was dominating Florence, and everyone was like, well, clearly Maru is the best player in the world. The people were saying, no, 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 Cyril's so dominant. I reckon he'll beat Maru. So there's a lot of like excitement around when they would fight later in the year, but people already said, it's already over. It's already decided, dude, guys, Maru destroyed Cyril. Now, I remembered that there was always a bit of an asterisk on this game where people would say, oh, it doesn't really count because the Raven. And I was like, oh, was this actually played on the Raven patch? So I looked up the VOD and I did find this. Now, if you watch, those anti-armor missiles did damage and they were stackable. Cyril's army just got obliterated. <laughs> this is actually a sick series. The games were really close long macro games, like lots of spellcaster usage. But I specifically remember this period uh, very deeply. And it has a special place in my heart because I'd only been playing Terran at this time for maybe two years. And I still struggled with ghosts and multiple siege units and all the micro. And this was the one meta where I could just make Thors at my level, Helldats, a move and just cast anti-armor missiles. You get like 20 ravens. All you needed to do was survive to the late game and you were unkillable. Terran was kind of busted because storms, fungals, parasitic bombs, no other spell splash damage in StarCraft is stackable. So even though it costs 75 energy per missile, you couldn't really dodge them. They go out really quickly. I'm going to show you guys that last fight again. Just look at how quickly the anti-armor missiles come out and you're really going to realize just how powerful this was. It was obscene. I mean, it's, it, do you guys remember when infestors could fungal without popping out of the ground? A lot of people forget that this was a thing in like 2017, I want to say, maybe 2016, and no one used it for six months because everyone was like, you can't get to infestors, it's too hard. And I was like, guys, this is clearly the most broken thing ever. And then Dark abused it for like a month and they instantly nerfed it because it was like, oh, the other players started using it. People were like, oh, this is clearly broken. And I was like, obviously. Um, the Raven thing, Maru and a few others figured it out much quicker. They were destroying with it and it did get nerfed right after this. So... There is a small asterisk on this. I still think it's a very impressive victory. I'm not saying this doesn't count for anything. A lot of people do that with balance. Beyond's World Championship doesn't count because the Reaper was too strong. I still think this counts as a good win. I would just say small asterisk next to it is the Raven was busted at this time. Fair enough though, Maru still won. It still counts as him beating Serral. I just don't think it is the end all and the be all. Number one, it's only one match. Number two, Raven was busted and got fixed right afterwards. All right, so you basically had Serral crushing his scene, Maru crushing his scene. And what we're actually looking at now is people were so excited for this tournament. It was GSL versus the world was the first time we got to see the regions clash and decide who is greater, Serral or Maru. Now, unfortunately, Maru fell out early in the individual format tournament to, I think, like stats or someone like that. And basically, Serral ended up just dominating that. Uh, well, not dominating. It was a very close series with stats, but he beat stats in the grand finals and won the individual tournament. But in the team tournament they run alongside it, they did get to play a best of one, where Team Serral versus Team Maru, you could see they even named the teams that. And they did play a single map here on Lost and Found, which Serral did end up winning. But it didn't really decide anything in anyone's mind. But like, it's one map, Serral wins best of one versus Maru. Cool, like, it is what it is. So everyone was still super duper hyped for BlizzCon to see what was going to happen there. Who would actually win when push came to shove at BlizzCon. So all eyes were on BlizzCon now. The big world championship, the moment we were going to see them face off. Both players made it out of their groups really easily. And then Maru unfortunately faced his Jinnia Green Wings teammate SOS in the quarterfinals. And he kind of played to SOS's strengths. He tried to kind of cheese SOS. And I know some people said, oh, Protoss was busted at this time. You couldn't beat them with Terran unless you proxied and cheesed. But we saw moments like that. He knew SOS was on one base blink and he decided to boost a medevac of mines straight into the Stalkers and lost the... It was Maru not showing up at LAN and at the biggest tournament of the year. And of course, Serral went on to win the tournament and, and, and become the world champion. But the thing is, this wasn't an isolated incident. This is something that often happened to Maru at these international events is we were used to seeing one form of Maru and then at the big overseas international events, we'd see a different form, whether it was the jet lag, the traveling to events. Uh, he had a, shul a shoulder injury that sometimes flares up. Lots of people had lots of reasons for it. Whatever it is, this happened quite a few times. So due to Maru falling out of events early quite often, unfortunately, we just didn't see Serral and Maru run into each other. There are other events where Maru was doing really well. Serral fell out a little bit early. More often than not though, let's be honest, Rogue would beat Maru 
and and stop them kind of getting to match into each other, which is kind of unfortunate. I mean, Rogue is a monster, no shame losing to him. But we just got denied the Serral Maru match for a long time in 2019, and we were almost like, I guess it's never happening. We're never going to have this decided, those two playing at a live tournament. Well, guess what? It's 2024, six years have passed, and it's at this point, it has actually been seen who would win if you make these two play head-to-head. -head. If you just go on a Ligulac, lovely stats website, search Serral vs. Maru, you can see some things. Serral is 39 wins and 19 losses in maps, and in actual series score, 14 wins and 4 losses. That's almost 80%. That's almost 4 wins for every loss. And you've got to realize, not only did he 4-0 him in Katowice, 3-0 to Mirren Masters Coliseum, there's a lot of big events. Let's also... Well, some of these aren't as important as others. If we scroll up and down this list, right? And you're absolutely right. I would point out an even starker stat, which is the only time Maru has beaten Serral at LAN was that WESG tournament with the Ravens that we just talked about back then when they were both starting to explode in terms of dominance. He 3 0 would Serral in that tournament, and since then he has never beaten him offline ever again. Now, to be fair, that's only five times they've played. Four wins for Serral, one for Maru. But it's often coming in pretty damn big events, important tournaments, and it is hard to argue with when it keeps happening like that. Because often, not only is Serral beating Maru when they face head-to-head, -head, when Maru's getting knocked out early, Serral's often going on to win the tournament. And this is huge. Because, I mean, if we've got a GOAT debate between a guy from 2020 and a guy from 2010... You're never going to decide. It's always going to be subjective, right? You're like, no, he would beat him. He wouldn't beat him. Nah, he would. He wouldn't. You're going to be arguing for, for days. And it's fun. It's fun. It's awesome. But you don't really draw any conclusions. I feel like when you have a GOAT debate, who's the greatest, and they're playing the same age, it just solves things kind of for you, doesn't it? When, you know, they play at the same tournaments and one wins and the other doesn't. Now, now you can argue these are different formats. You can argue these aren't the format that favors Maru. I would also argue they are the most prestigious tournaments in the world, and therefore it's kind of hard to go and place, you know, these best of ones and these, these GSL tournaments higher than the most prestigious tournaments in the world. It's very hard to do that. Anyway, before we get too stuck into the comparisons, let's actually just look at Serral's results so I can talk you through the ridiculousness of, of what this career is. All right, guys, so look at Serral's ridiculous career. Wins Leipzig in 2018. He's just finished high school. Gets his first finals in Yonchipping. I think he was still in high school at that point. And when he finishes school and puts all of his focus on playing, it's just like you just see this crazy difference. Same thing happened with Neeb when he finished school as well. You see these, these players suddenly give their all and it's crazy. Top 8 at Pyeongchang. Top 4 at Katowice. Got beat by Classic there. 3-0. Got kind of smashed. WSG. 3-0 by Maru. So not an amazing international start to the year. Kind of getting his feet under use, underneath him, used to playing these international events, getting gets wrecked a bunch of times with very high placings still. Very high placings, not bad. But then he wins every WCS tournament that year. Leipzig, Austin, Valencia, Montreal. Montreal's the only one that was really close uh, because Rainer kind of finally was turned 16 and was able to play in, in tournaments because he wasn't allowed before that legally. And he actually almost beat Serral there as a 4-3. to three. But other than that, it's great. Wins GSL versus the world. Goes to the global finals, beats Stats there in the finals, 4-2. Beats Rogue, who everyone thought was going to win once Maru was eliminated, 3-1. Wins Home Story Cup. Uh, top 8 at Katowice, wins WCS Spring, wins GSL versus the World in 2019 again. Obviously, lots of top 2s and top 4s I'm not even really mentioning because we'd be here forever. Wins WCS Fall, wins another Home Story Cup. Uh, wins uh, DreamHack Summer, wins DreamHack Winter. Ignoring all the second places, there's a billion of them in there. Uh, it wins DreamHack Winter and DreamHack Fall in 2021. Uh, that's the EU DreamHack Winter, sorry. And then he wins the overall DreamHack Fall. Uh, wins the next Season 2 tournament, barely over Lambo. Lambo did a great video about that one. Katowice 2022 wins that over Reina, 4-3. TSL 9 wins that one. Home Story Cup wins that one. And you can just see how many golds there are across this period. Similar to what we looked at with Life's earlier, but over a six-year span. SC2 Masters... ESL Summer, Masters Coliseum, SC2 Masters, Masters Coliseum, and of course the 4-0 Katowice over Maru here that we've just seen very recently. Don't get me wrong, he doesn't win every tournament. No one does in StarCraft. It's such a high variance game. There's so many things that go on. You play so many matches, and when you're one of the best players, everyone studies you and comes in with sniper builds prepared to take you down. You do, you don't, no, nobody wins everything they play. But this here is obviously a massively impressive list of results that is just stunning.
Now, obviously, Miz was saying, well, a lot of these tournaments aren't worth as much. They're region locked. And I get it. I get it. The region locked tournaments aren't worth as much. And that's true. But they're sprinkled in with him beating the best players in the world from those more competitive tournaments at the same time. And this is where the argument falls apart. If we go look at the stats, which Miz himself put up on Serral's head-to-head -head record against notable players, it is obscene. Notice, look at this column here. Offline only is what we're interested in. You can look at online as well. And those, those stats are sometimes even crazier. But I, I really like offline only because it shows these are like the big live tournaments. Players have flown in. There's tons of money and prestige on the line. These are the most important events. He has an 80% win record versus Maru, 4 to 1. 100% versus Rogue, 70% against Innovation. Wait, wait, let's just read the 100%. He has 100% versus Rogue, Dark, Trap, Cure, Hero, and TY on LAN. And it's not a tiny sample size. It's not a massive sample size, but still. 4 0, 6 0, 4 0, 2 0, 2 0, 3 0. That, nobody has stats like this. Nobody. He's got 12 to 4 wins versus Rainer on land, 75%. 6 to 1 versus Clem, almost 86%. The only player he's negative against here is Solar. And that's a really small sample size of 1 to 2. If you look at their online, obviously it's 14 to 5 in his favor, 74%. You know, is Solar going to keep beating him there? I think there's strong doubts on that for a lot of people because now he really is ready. Every time he's played Solar since then, he's looked on a different level. The, the next closest is Stats at 5 wins, 3 loss, 63% win rate. And then Sue, who's got 3 wins for 6 losses against Serral. Serral's win records during this period are absolutely insane. So you can look at these results and you can basically compare them and go like, Oh my god, don't get me wrong. Maru's winning GSLs, which you could argue, and I think you're absolutely correct. Those GSLs in 2018 were harder to win than Serral's WCSs. And that's actually a decent argument. The problem is that Serral showed in between winning those tournaments that he could beat the best from GSL repeatedly. That's where things get funny. So basically, Serral's shown up for six years straight, beat the best players the world has to offer. But because those other players, most of them have played in the Korean region in their own tournaments, if you have good results consistently there, you there have stacked up a more impressive resume than Serral. I think that's an actual argument you could kind of make here. You could say Maru has a better resume than Serral. Can you say he's the greatest player compared to Serral? If you're just looking at like how many high placings and wins in hard tournaments, I think there's like there's a way you can almost like statistically like just make sense of this with the way Miz has like done their rating system in a way. On the other hand, it's 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 kind of crazy because his achievements aren't as good even though he's clearly the better player is essentially what we're saying right here. <laughs> Is that not insane? I see, saying it out loud, I'm like, that sounds insane. So, I mean, what, what would Serral have to do to defy this, though? Because you got to realize, when Maru was doing that stuff in 2013 to 2015, Serral was still in school. Did Ser Serral needed, should he have left school when he was 15, go to Korea, compete in Pro League, compete in those other leagues? Because if he, was he born too late? Did he need to leave school early? Like, what exactly are we saying here? Is it like Serral can't possibly prove he's as good because he couldn't compete during that age? To, to me, that if you prove you're better than Maru and you're better than all the guys Maru's competing with repeatedly, it's so it, it's so crazy. Like, if these GSLs later on that Maru won are still worth so much more, you're like, well, well, no, it's not just that, but these GSLs are worth more than the regionals. It's like, but he keeps dominating the best players from those tournaments. Does that not lower their rating at all? Surely it should either lower their rating or boost his rating. There's got to be some sort of conversion to beating the best players, actually meaning you are the best player. Like, it just, it seems insane to not make that correlation. I think at this point, even if he were to go to Korea or anything like that, it's too late to prove himself. It's not as competitive in Korea anymore. I think basically when Serral beat Rogue in that really close three to one semis in the 2018 BlizzCon, I think that was for me when I was like, oh my God. And then the fact that he kept doing that sort of thing over and over again and beating the best Korea Dolphin, that was when I started to like see him cement himself I was like, this, this could, could be the greatest, you know, if he keeps this up. And he did keep it up for six years. And this last year, like literally up until Katowice a month ago, it has been the most dominant we've ever seen Serral. And the thing is, Zerg got nerfed and changed up in a few ways. A few of his tools like Broodlords are nowhere near what they used to be. The Viper got slightly nerfed. And guys like Rainer and Dark have been quite vocal about like, they're like, oh, we're kind of struggling now a little bit. And Serral just comes out with so many well-prepared builds, a mixture of cheesy timings, all-ins, 
amazing scouting, amazing mid game, amazing late game. He's really evolved to the whole package. He started as a very defensive scouting oriented player. Now he does everything. And that is just so, so impressive. He's shown that he's not just a guy who's going to be there for a year or two or abuse one thing. He's developed into the whole package. And when players are playing against him, they say, Serral's playing the styles we hate to play against. That's what Maru said after Katowice. He's like, dude, even after I watched Serral versus Clem, I realized he was going to play all the things that us Terrans hate to play against. He said that in the interview with Crank. That's what I was, I was thinking watching it. I was like, wow, this is annoying because you can't assume anything. He's always bringing out surprises. He's so hard to play against. Okay guys, so, so you can hear, basically Serral is clearly the greatest of all time. I, I don't think there's any real serious argument about this. Uh, people will disagree and I'd, I'd love to hear it, but I wanted to address one thing I've seen a lot in the threads and the forums of people saying. People have been saying, Terran is weak. They were always weak. They couldn't beat Protoss for like 2018, 2019, 2020. Terran's been the weakest race, and Maru's been the one guy who defies the imbalance inherent within StarCraft. And this is honestly probably the best argument you guys have for like Maru being the greatest of all time. It's, it's not that he didn't play as an outlier. He did. He was a big outlier in 2018, 2019, when, when a lot of Terrans, especially in Korea, were struggling, especially in TVP. The thing is, when you start making arguments based on balance, it gets messy, right? So, so if TVP, ZVT are like 0.5% out of balance, it does make a massive difference on pro results. It's just hard to separate balance from pro performances, right? So if you say, L just look at the stats, look at the stats, everything should be 50-50. Um, number one, who, 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 uh, who are we balancing off? Uh, top eight players, who's actually winning the tournament? Top 50, top 1,000, all of ladder. Wh whose results, whose statistics are we looking at? Number one. Um, number two, isn't it always going to be the case where like if one race has a few really well, like say it's 50-50 and then you get a few players come up for say Terran, they're way better than the players of the other races. That win rate goes up and then you're like, oh, if we're, if we're looking at tournament results and then you're like, oh, we're just going to nerf that to balance it out. Basically, anytime a player is is exceptional, like imagine in this fantasy world where like the, the game was balanced every month to keep it 50-50 in, in all directions between the races, you'd end up with a situation where you've got three factions who are just kept at 50% no matter the skill of the players. Oh, you're really good? You just get nerfed down. You're 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 excelling too much. We're going to nerf your race down. And don't get me wrong, that probably to some extent does just kind of happen naturally in StarCraft because things do try to get back to 50/50 and like people like we hope Beyond got Reapers nerfed and, and this sort of stuff does happen. But uh I think it's something where it's it's so nebulous to figure out like where is the actual balanced point? Where is player skill end and balance start? And I don't have an answer to that. I'm not going to say you're wrong if you have this view. I'm not going to say that. I'm just going to point out you can't prove your viewpoint. It's really hard to prove. It's very hard to even discuss. So if you want to have this discussion, feel free to get into it with each other. I just feel like we'd need to write a 50 page article to even begin discussing it. And I don't think we'd get any conclusions out of it. We'd just get more questions, you know? Uh, 42 is, is the answer. We're like, oh crap. That's the, the meaning to life. I guess we need to figure out the question now. It's it's essentially that scenario. It gets way too complicated. Anyways, Serral's clearly the greatest of all time. Anyone who disagrees is a dumb dumb. Shout at me in the comments about why I'm wrong. And uh, let me know who you think should have been on the list that was uh, maybe uh, completely shafted. Dark, hello? Dark not getting put on the list? What the hell? Yeah, I mean, Dark has so many top fours and not as many seconds compared to some of the other guys, but his top fours are like so consistent over so many years. And I think he's like rank three or four in terms of total earnings in the game. It's hard to ignore Dark. Rainer, I think probably could have got top 10 as well. Even though his career has been shorter, he has had some of the highest highs. Um, just the fact that he's been actually one of the, he's, he's the, like been one of the best players to kind of challenge Serral at land for certain periods, which is why I think Rainer maybe deserves a spot up there as well. It's always hard to say. Uh, I don't have my own definitive top 10, but I definitely think Life, Rainer, Dark, all deserve special mentions. All Zergs? Oh my god, I'm so Zerg biased. Ah, shout out me in the comments. See you next time. Thanks for watching. Bye, everyone. Bye!